Um, we'll get started with our set of pre-prepared questions. The first group of questions concern some of the basic questions that we um, have about transgender and gender non-conforming youth. Um, so first, what does it mean to say that a child or adolescent is gender non-conforming or transgender? I've got it. Go ahead. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, uh, when a child or adolescent uh, youth is gender non-conforming or transgender, it simply means that they uh, wish to or has identified a gender uh, identity that deviates from a traditional rearing and uh, sex assigned at birth uh, and its congruence, traditional congruence, not mandated, not God-given, not normal, but simply a congruence of your sex assigned at birth and how you perform gender, how you've been traditionally raised to perform gender. That simply means that your child is deviating from that, like many children, many people before them throughout the beginning of time. It doesn't mean that they uh, want to castrate themselves or hold their lives back or make some life-altering decision that many of us haven't already made already, some of us at young ages, they're simply having an understanding of themselves that deviates from what has been common, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're deviating from something that is normal. Yeah, okay, I'll mm -hmm. go. Um, so what does it mean to say a child or adolescent is gender nonconforming or transgender? Um, everything <laughs> exactly that Madeline says. And it just means that a child has an understanding of themselves that, um, if you want to be very frank, that not a lot of people have, that not a lot of even adults have, right? Mm -hmm. So if a child is saying this, uh, I'm telling you they mean this. <laughs> they mean it 110%. Um, you don't go to an individual and say, I'm something I'm not, right? Um, the idea that it's a fad, right, or that um, it's something that will pass, um, it doesn't exist, right? It's not a fad, it's not that it's something that it will pass. It's something that a child feels deep in their heart um, and should be listened to and should be respected by everyone. And I mean, transgender is very much an umbrella. We are so conditioned um, from the time that we are conscious of ourselves and other people that it's either black and white, it's one way or the other. We are so binaryized <laughs> that we don't see any type of spectrum. And I, I would, you know, I would bet that most of us in this room question ourselves at some point. That's what puberty is, okay? That is what growth is. That's what going from elementary to middle school to high school to big college or your trade if you will, you're questioning along the way. So we're not boxing transgender beings. It just means that what we have been plagued with, with what is assigned and what you must be and what you must do with what we have assigned you to be, children, and children do know what they know because ageism also works backwards. Mm -hmm. It's not just about doing something to the elderly, we don't believe in our children because they're children. But is following their lead and saying, what you said to be true does not apply to me, okay. period. Thank you, I love that. Ageism works backwards. Yes. Um, yes. Are there any other thoughts on this question? Okay. Um, there, so, was a, there was a hand. Sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, yeah. So what that would mean is, is if a, if a child is coming to you and saying that they are gender nonconforming, that means that um, how they have been raised so far in gender is not something that they necessarily agree with internally. They're saying that this actually does not define me. Like, you know, as you said, like this does not define who I am. Can I? Um, sure. Yeah, to put it more plainly. Um, so if a child comes up to an individual and says, I don't, if they were told that they were a boy and they say, I don't feel like I'm a boy, right? I feel like I'm a girl or I feel like I'm neither 
a boy nor a girl, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, that is a transgender or gender non-conforming child. Um, and it's really important that we listen to children. Um, yeah, so yeah. that's what transgender, gender non-conforming child is. Because when you conform, that means um, I'm following what people say you're supposed to do. So when I had my child and the doctor said, it's a girl, I was overjoyed because I already had three boys, right? <laughs> so I'm like, woohoo, <laughs> yes. And my daughter and I had girls day, got our nails done, and I did everything that stereotypically I'm supposed to do from mommy to daughter, right? But we would go get our nails done and I'm wondering why by the time we get home, you scraped all the nail polish off your nails. I'm wondering why you don't wanna do what I've been conditioned girls are supposed to do. And so my child got tired of it and wasn't feeling good inside. Yeah. So school was affected, how my child interacted with the family, I just didn't recognize it. And then so I just asked my child, and my child said, okay, remember conforming. Yeah. I don't wanna do what you all keep telling me girls need to do. I don't feel right about that. Yeah. And so everyone's story is different, right? Because my daughter said, no, I am a boy, period. So from my standpoint, I'm like, wait a minute, my child's not conforming to what the doctor said. Mm. Doctor said I have a girl. What's up? Why are you not, what? <laughs> I'm just okay. trying to talk to you, right? And so if my child says, no mom, I'm not your daughter, I'm your son, I'm not conforming to what society said. Because when the doctor looked at me, that's what the doctor went by. Mm -hmm. But my child grew and said, no, no, you can't define me. Mm. I'm telling you who I am. So non-conforming is I'm not going with what the crowd does. I'm doing what is good for me. And that's what my son said to me. And I've followed his lead ever since because now in two more years, he'll be in college. Okay. So we've gone through this a very long time. And, you know, it's rough, but it's worth it. Because if I'm going to shine, I'm going to shine bright mm -hmm. and my light not by following the crowd. So that's what we mean by non-conforming. I'm gonna do what's good for me, <laughs> not everybody else in the class. Does that help? Okay, huh? Awesome. <laughs> Thank y'all. Right. Yes. Thank you. Uh, our next question, why is it important to allow youth to freely explore their gender identity rather than to discourage the behavior? Yeah, I wanna go first. <laughs> I like this question. Um, why is it important to allow youth to freely explore their gender rather than discourage them from their behavior? Children are children. Kids are kids. Kids want to explore everything, right? Like what kids play in the mud, right? Kids play dress up, kids play with toys. Um, it's so important to let an individual explore their gender because it just allows children to be children. And then you grow up when they grow up, you watch them grow up to be like so happy, right? We're talking, we're talking about a marginalized, um, and to, to sh make the word marginalized more um, youth friendly, um, a group of individuals um, who aren't being seen a lot of times, right? Who aren't being talked about a lot of times, and when they are being talked about, right? It's people are being mean about it, right? When when you allow a kid to express their gender when they start getting older, right, and they start growing into themselves, it becomes, le you become less and less worried about what other people have to say because you know like your parents, your grandparents, your cousins, right, your siblings, they already seen this. And when you go home, you know you're going home. Um, and you're going home happy. And the reason I got excited to say is I, tra I started transitioning um, when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I had a parent who allowed me to express my gender. And I think it is so important um, because here I am, 25 years old, right? And um, at one point in time, um, I didn't think I was gonna make it past the age of 18. Yeah. 
So that's why it's important to allow adolescents to enjoy their gender and explore their gender. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, what she said. Um, <laughs> because it was perfect. Um, and I come from the exact opposite. So I also started transitioning when I was a teenager, but I was also like a runaway, like I was like abused out of my home. So I had to learn how to be the woman I wanted to be um, in the streets and alone and often afraid and not sure of what was going on. So it took a lot of fighting on my end. And if I had the opportunity to have accepting and loving family members, including my mother, to help me through those things when I was young, it would have made a world of a difference. Now, me and my mother were great now, but I really would have appreciated a more understanding approach from her um, back then. Am I grateful for where we are now? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very important to let um, our children truly understand themselves in this very, you know, very unique way because as they get older, like these are the, the new leaders, the leaders of the new school, if you will, who will be redefining how we view gender, how we can now start understanding that gender is not definitive upon our body parts. They are showing us that there is an understanding of who we are beyond that, and we should let them do that. And this is where following their lead comes from. The children truly can teach us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and going off of that, that is the thing, right? I've had to unlearn all the nonsense that I've been taught uh, since I could talk, right? And who is leading this teaching? My son. Mm -hmm. And I'm very thankful because we are so warped, like I said, by this binary way of thinking that it's either this or that. When people, the human, just human existence is on a spectrum. There is no one way for women to be, no one way for men to be, no one way for a human being to be. I don't fit in your slot. What excites me and gives me joy is not either this or that. And if we don't allow our children to explore, what type of damage are we really doing? Um, you know, we have to be able to own and admit as adults, we don't know everything. And our children should be free in their spirit and their mind to explore. It doesn't mean that it's gonna go bad, right? Okay. Everyone that's, you know, every child that says, you know, I think I wanna wear this, or I think I feel like this, that is not a guarantee that when they're, like 10 years from then, they're not gonna be probably what you wished. And if it's not what you wish, so be it. Yeah. That child is here for a reason. And why would you ever want to have your child live in such a dismal reality where I can't be myself yeah. because it doesn't fit mm -hmm. what society says it's supposed to be? Mm -hmm. And we have to allow children to be human and teach us, yo, relax, because <laughs> things could be worse. Yeah. Thank you all. <laughs> Um, all right, um, here's another question for y'all. What are some ways that adults in the life of a transgender or gender non-conforming youth might support them? Okay, so um, when my son first introduced himself to me, I didn't even really even understand. I, I was not familiar with the word transgender. I can openly admit that I was a child of all the stereotypes, the horrible names that referenced those that were not in a binary. And I'm not even gonna say them, okay? But I'm sure many of you who are older know what we just call people that didn't fit into what you should be fitting into. So, you know, to be honest, I'm looking at myself, what did I do? What did I do wrong? How am I going to do this? I was a principal and a town, um, I lived in upstate New York. How am I going to help my child? But I was thinking about me, me, me. And so when my son said, you know, I need help. And this is not just about mom when you were young because I was tomboyish most of my life. 
I was on dirt bikes. I still have scars on me trying to do wheelies, and I failed miserably. Um, I was with the, with the guys on the block. It just was my thing. I didn't want, I mean, did I have dolls? I sure did. But when that bike was going and when they were playing some kickball in the street, Nadine was the first one up there. And I dare someone not to choose me because I'm going to be on that team anyway. So that's just how I was. So I thought that's how my child was. No, it was kind of different. So when I saw that my child needs me, and I already know if I'm this ignorant, watch when he goes outside and how he's going to be treated. My child has to know when you come home, I got you. Your brother's got you. Mm -hmm. And I had to prepare him, which a piece of me did not want that to happen. We're going to lose some friends and we're going to lose some family in terms of not supporting. And we did. And I'm okay with it because my child comes first. Mm -hmm. So when my child saw that, hands down, I'm, I'm team Z. I'm, I'm on your team. And if I'll go through hell for my child, but my child has to know that. And once he saw that, and I allowed him to be free to be who he is now, I have never seen my child so happy. So the I love you's come daily. When someone says, you know, early on, would you and your son like something? Oh my gosh, to see his eyes light up. I'm like, okay, yep, I got it. When he got his first haircut, I'm not even, I'm not even lying. I saw sunshine behind my son. I was like, first of all, dang, you look good, right? I get it because you know what? The mistakes that people make is about the bedroom. It's about sex. My child was six years old. We're not even going there. And so this is why we have this, and you have some strong people up here, because we have to like, get that out of your mind. That is the misinformation that you're receiving. My son just wanted to be happy. And because we have gone through so much negativity, we had to have each other. Because if your child doesn't have you, like my sister said up here, why should I co-sign my son going through that battle? Mm. That's not what I define as a mother. Yeah. It's not about Nadine. It's about the child that I bore. You're not what I'm going to make you to be. You're not my property. Mm. You are someone that I have been chosen to protect you yeah. and nourish you. And I'm just saying that our lives are so much better despite what we go through. We still go through on a daily basis. <laughs> in my home, we got it. I wish someone would try to come up in my space okay. and negatize it because I got something for you. Oh, say that. I'll leave it there. Okay. I'm just all that to say, I love my, I love my son. Yes. Okay, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> so, yes, uh, affirmation. Uh -huh. um, you know, using the right pronouns, really embracing, you know, this new experience that you have. Like my mom said the mm. same thing. When my mother started to like compliment how I looked, mm. like we just were going through, we have this ritual where we uh, go through like all of the perfume that she's gonna throw <laughs> away that is brand new, full bottles, but she only has so much dresser. So I get to have it. And we're going through like the jewelry and stuff that she just buys an impulse but looks better with my clothes. And we're talking <laughs> and um, she looks at me and she goes, so my pet name is Mina. She calls me Mina. She goes, Mina, like you really look so pretty. Like every time I see you, I always tell everybody at the job, look at my baby, look at my baby. And y'all like, oh, holding back tears I'm just like thank you mom I really appreciate it but little does she know like when I was four and five and seven and eight and 12 and 13 y'all I prayed for this hmm. I prayed to a God I was told wasn't going to listen to me I prayed anyway for that for that one thing 
for my mother to see the beautiful woman that I imagined since I was younger, mm -hmm. the beautiful girl I wanted to be since I was younger. For her to finally see that for me at my, you know, well-seasoned age of 42. Um, <laughs> but hearing her say that to me throughout the years as I fully took in and embraced my own transition, that's another important thing of letting uh, your children explore gender because then they are more sure of themselves within it when they make the decision. So her affirming me helped me battle my own internalized transphobia mm. that I was taking into myself. So her he saying that to me, it's, if, it's, if heaven is anything like that, mm. I'll take it by the buckets. Okay. I don't know how to top that one, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but... um. Mm. So a few ways that adults can support um, transgender and gender non-conforming um, youth, listen. Mm. And not just listen, like actively listen. Listen to what the child is saying, yeah. right? Whether it's your child or somebody else's child. Um, if a child is telling you that they are transgender or gender non-conforming, you're lucky. Mm. That is a privilege. Yeah. Mm. That is a privilege. Not all children feel safe, and in the world that we live in today, it is extremely hard to feel safe and to know that the person you are telling, right, it's, it's hard to tell if that person is going to continue to make you feel safe mm -hmm. after you come out as trans, mm -hmm. right? Um, I was very safe with telling my mom, and I told my mom first, but my mom did not tell my stepfather for like six months. Mm -hmm until my mom completely was okay with the idea of me being trans. My mom did not tell my stepfather because it was not safe. Yeah. That is the reality of this, right? Mm -hmm. So listen, and af not after, but while you're actively listening, do your research mm -hmm. and don't look for misinformation, like reach out. There are so many resources, there's CHOP, there's Galay, there's The Attic, right? Mm -hmm. There's Mazzoni. The list goes on and on and on and on. People will be more than happy to answer your call and answer any questions that you have mm -hmm. about what it is to be transgender. And yeah. that's just what it is, right? What it is to be transgender. All of these places have transgendered individuals employed, right? There's always somebody to talk to. Mm -hmm. Listen to your child. And then from there, you take the appropriate steps. Mm -hmm. You don't take, like Nadine said, mm -hmm. it's not about you. Mm -hmm. It's not about any of you, it's about the child mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. 30, 40, 50, we're all adults. Mm -hmm. We are all are capable of making our own decisions, mm -hmm. right? And to find our happiness. So if there is a youth around us who is not capable of making those decisions to find their happiness, it is your job to help them find the happiness that y'all hoped for when y'all were young. Because when we were all young, we all had a sense of we wanted to be happy, right? We wanted to come out of poverty. We didn't want to live in this neighborhood. We didn't want to go to that school. We didn't want to do this. We didn't want to eat that for dinner, right? And then you become adults and you're like, I'm not going to eat that for dinner. I'm not going to go to that neighborhood, right? Like, my children not going to go to that school that I didn't like going to when I was a child. <laughs> that same way that you think, you should afford children the same opportunity of being mm. happy. Mm as who they are and the skin that they live in so that there is no guilt. Because I tell you, when I say guilt is built, mm -hmm. you have so wow. much guilt as a trans person when you are denied, mm -hmm. denied, 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 denied. My father, my biological father, denied me for six years, denied. Mm -hmm. And I had so much guilt. Like th there were days I would never want to detransition, but I, I promise you, in the back of my mind, I'm like, maybe my father would like me a little more if, you know, I pull my hair back, put a ball cap on, and, you know, um, binded my breast down. Oh, good luck. There were times when I thought like that, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like, there were. And I lived with so much guilt until my father came around and was like, you're my daughter. I love you. <laughs> so six years later, um, after abandoning me <laughs> for six years. Um, <laughs> But no, 
you don't want a child to live with that. That guilt could turn into thoughts of self-harm, mm -hmm. could turn into suicidal thoughts, um, and then could lead your child down all those rabbit holes that you don't want your child to go down. Um, speak very honest, sex working, um, addictions, all of those things. And to be very clear and very frank, all of those adversities don't just affect trans individuals, they affect any child exactly. mm -hmm. who, grow, who grow up in tough situations, who feel guilt, who feel abandoned, who feel unheard, and who are uncared for. Um, I'm only mentioning it because I want people to understand the reality of it, but that reality is across the board for all children, not just transgender children. And let me just really add very quickly, you know, you don't have to understand fully what your child is going through or the youth in your life is going through to support. Mm. I did not understand everything, but what I do understand is you need me, I'm there. Mm. And I was very honest with my child. You know, again, we talk down to children. You're a child, you don't understand. Now my child really knew what was going on. So I was very honest. I, I don't quite understand. Would you be patient with me? But the pronouns, thank you. That was automatic. The name, automatic. Mm -hmm. Because I need to acknowledge your existence. So if you don't understand, that is okay. I'm telling you right now, I did not. I mourned a little bit. I just, mm -hmm. I just discussed. After three boys, somebody said, hey, you got a girl. Woo. And talk about the jewelry. <laughs> I am a jewelry fiend. So I just was like, Thank you, Lord. I got a little me. <laughs> the jewelry, the nails, great, because these boys get on my nerves. <laughs> and then what does my daughter do? No, nope, I'm on that team. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> Keep your jewelry. Keep your nail polish. I'm good. But it's like, okay, things could be worse, like I said. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. This is not something that... Yep, I got, a, I got a doctorate in it, and I'm good. No, it changes all the time, because okay. people change all the time. But I do know that my child is happy. And no, I don't have a daughter. But I still have the same child. I didn't get stuck on that title anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'm blessed nonetheless, even though I got four boys. <laughs> I'm the queen in the house. So, That's you know, right. I, turn, I turn the table. Okay. What could be the blessing? I'm the only female up in this piece. That's you ain't right. got shared So jewelry. serve me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't got to share my jewelry or my lipstick or my clothes. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, these next questions are focused on medical transition and... Um, we are missing one member of our panel tonight, a very important member of our panel, who's our doctor, our physician. So um, for this portion, I'm gonna read the question and then I'll be reading a transcript of um, an answer that was previously given at one of our other events um, from uh, a physician. So um, I hope you like the sound of my voice. <laughs> All right, so this question is for young children before puberty, are there any medical treatments given relating to transition? And if so, what are they? And I will just chime in for our panel. Um, I'll read this, and then if you all want to add anything, okay. I'll repeat the question. How about that? Okay, so for young children before puberty, are there any medical treatments given relating to transition? And if so, what are they? This is the answer from our physician from a previous panel. There are no specific pre-puberty medical interventions for transgender or gender non-conforming youth because there is no specific medical intervention necessary at that time. We have this picture in our head that to transition is surgery. Some people think about certain medications or hormones, which we term as medical transition, but there are many ways to transition. It doesn't mean one thing. There's not a linear path to transition. It's a very personal journey for people, and it can look like many things, and it can change over time. Just like anything else in medicine, if there's going to be no benefit from a med medication, we're not going to give any medications. There's nothing medical or surgical that needs to happen before pu puberty, and the reason for that is because people's bodies don't become how we traditionally think of an adult male or adult female until puberty. And so children have this amazing ability to be gender fluid without any medical interventions or medicine. 
People can change their name or pronouns, they could do a legal transition, and they can dress however they would like to dress. People can present in a very fluid manner until puberty hits, and so we don't have any need for medical treatments at this stage because none is needed. So that's the answer from our um, position from our previous panel. Um, so I'll pose the question again to the panelists if you want to weigh in, no pressure. For young children before puberty, are there any medical treatments given relating to transition? And if so, what are they? Any other thoughts? Just reiterate. So I'm going to just reiterate very loudly for everyone to hear, even in this very soothing conversational voice. Um, none because none are necessary. And I'm going to go a little further into that to explain that this is transgender, gender nonconforming. Gender is something that is performed, that we all perform, albeit traditional or not, we all perform how we want to present our gender. And then when we are talking about things like surgery, that in some way, shape, or form may or may not alter in some way our sex assigned at birth. Those are two different things. They are not meant to be congruent, just commonly they are. So when we talk about, oh, well, this means that they're going to have these surgeries that will castrate them, and we'll get to the questions at the bottom of this in a second, I repeat, as the physician said, none, because none are necessary. Children are allowed to express gender through clothing, through name change, through pronoun change, in a way that they see fit. And if they choose to change their minds, like some children do, they're allowed to do that also, because gender is not only expansive, it is an exploration of understanding of self. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like talking in that voice in the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, does anyone else on our panel want to chime in on that, or should I move on to the next question? Uh -uh. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. All right, so the next question that focuses on um, medical treatments. What kind of medical treatments are given to transgender adolescents? What are the risks, benefits, and alternatives for these treatments? Um, so this is the answer from our physician. When we consider what we, well, see, I'm, it's not me. I'm not in the medical community. Again, from the physician. When we, I'm speaking in their voice. When we consider what we in the medical community term secondary sex characteristics, so what, this is a transcript, so I apologize if um, I'm not speaking. Uh, it's, it's, in, it's a little, this part is a little odd. Um, okay, I'll just reframe it. What you think of as a traditional male body or female body, we're talking about breast development, maybe curvy or hips, skin softening, hair softening, or for a male body, we think uh, body hair growth, uh, facial hair growth, uh, becoming a boxier shape. These are just what we think of as a traditional body, but we know there's many different kinds of bodies regardless of sex assigned at birth. But this is what we think of as the secondary sex characteristics, and they develop in puberty. So in terms of a medical intervention, once a patient enters the very earliest signs of puberty, their body might not look different yet, but if we did lab work, we would see that their body is about to enter puberty. There are puberty blockers that we can give to patients. Puberty blockers have been around for a very long time. They're a very safe medication. They're a 100% reversible medication. They basically pause the body's internal signal to, pr to progress through puberty. Yeah, puberty. As long as you take the medication, you should not be progressing through, um, let me start that again. As long as you take the medication, you should not be progressing through puberty, and you basically pause puberty, whatever it was. Uh, the physician then says, I'm trying to think of the side effects, but they're just so minimal that nothing is coming to mind right now. They're just that safe. Uh, Okay, the next part is puberty blockers were not just developed for transgender people. Puberty blockers, <laughs> puberty blockers are just the hormone that is naturally found in the body. Uh, here's a puberty lesson. The way that puberty starts is in your brain, and uh, is, is in your brain, there are many h hormones, and one of those hormones starts pulsing like a lighthouse, and you can see the light going around and around, and as it pulses, that's what triggers puberty, and we have no idea why it starts. We can't predict when puberty will start, and we don't know why people go through puberty, or some people go through puberty earlier or later. We all, all we know is that it's this blinking hormone that starts it, and so all, of the, all that a puberty blocker is is a steady dose of that hormone, and because you shut it down, the blinking you shut down, 
And because you shut down the blinking, you shut down puberty. There is a condition where some patients go through puberty way too early. I believe the cutoff is before eight years old, which can be really harmful to a patient psychologically. It's bad for their bones, and it can lead to increased risks of all sorts of things. It's called precocious puberty, and puberty blockers were developed basically for kids who start puberty at age five. They were developed by an endocrinologist. They were not developed for this purpose. This is not a part of the trans agenda. They've been around a long time. I believe they were first used in the 1980s for this purpose, and my understanding of this medication is it hasn't changed because it's a naturally occurring hormone. The only thing that's changed is the way that it's given, like a shot or an implant, an implant form are the two most common ways, but the medication itself has not changed. The medication itself was not developed for gender transition and it has been around since we were giving medical intervention and it's been around since before we were giving medical intervention intervention to children for gender transition. Some patients will be on puberty blockers and some will come to us after they've gone through puberty and then you can give people hormones. These hormones are the ones we think of as being associated with males and females. The transmasculine hormone we give people is testosterone, and the transfeminine hormone is estrogen, which we give with a testosterone blocker to help it work. And the risks of those medications are pretty minimal, and the long-term risks are basically that you swap the long-term risks of the sex you were assigned to at birth for the risks of the sex you are transitioning to. So if you are transmasculine, anything you think of as an old lady disease like brittle bones or osteoporosis or migraines or breast cancer, those risks decrease when you take testosterone. And instead of things like heart attacks or balding become more likely and then vice versa in the other direction. We all grow old someday, so you're just swapping those risks out. And then the benefits are hopefully you're helping someone self-actualize a bit more, helping someone make their outsides match their insides helping someone not have to explain themselves all the time. All right. I wanna open it up for the panelists to weigh in if they have any thoughts, and I'll just say one more time the question. What kind of medical treatments are given to transgender adolescents? What are the risks, benefits, and alternatives for these treatments? So um, I kinda of wanna chime in. Um, I don't think there's much more to be said from that, but I, I wanna pair this with um, what are some ways that adults um, in the life of transgender and gender nonconforming youth might support them, and this is one of the ways um, talking more about like puberty blockers. Uh, when I got put on puberty blockers, um, let me tell y'all, I did not miss, and I was a very forgetful child. I've known Amina since I was, <laughs> since right before I started my transition. And I was very forgetful, but let me tell you what I was not forgetful about was taking my puberty blockers. When a doctor said, if you stop taking your puberty blockers, you might grow facial hair, that scared me <laughs> beyond a doubt. <laughs> I was terrified of facial hair, um, and it made me feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, not a little bit more, a hell of a lot more comfortable in my body, knowing that like body hair wasn't going <laughs> to be crazy, right? Um, this is one of the ways you could support them. It is extreme, like it's a reversible, extremely reversible. Um, yeah, so that's all I wanted to say. Was that was just the way you could support children. Yes. Yeah. And to really counter what we keep hearing, because uh, I'm I am greatly offended when um, these adults that don't know any trans or non-conforming people say that adults are grooming children. <laughs> I'm not going to say what they're really saying, but it's highly offensive. Dysphoria is real. And dysphoria means, you know, when my son looked in the mirror, he hated what he saw because that's not me. And so um, we did go with the um, blockers, which was like a miracle to me because, again, I'm walking this path not knowing what I'm doing. It took for us to leave upstate New York to come to Philadelphia and CHOP saved our lives for me to know the lingo, to know mm -hmm. this is normal, to know, okay, your child is going through some great dysphoria and we need to address it. Um, and luckily, uh, my child was starting puberty, so the blockers came right on time. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, this is a boy and a girl's body and some things have started. 
that is the loneliest place to be, mm -hmm. especially when you think of a school environment mm -hmm. because everyone's looking at you. Yeah. How are you developing compared to me? So this was a lifesaver. Um, so he started with the shots and then um, we had the implant, which the difference is uh, for the shot, he would have to go to the doctor every three months for the shot where the implant lasted over a year. Yeah. And we just had it replaced. But there was no forgetting, it was right there. And it, it stopped uh, my child from basically looking like a girl. And you know, like I said, um, just when I think about it, I get emotional because it's a very painful thing to look at your child and you can't do anything. Mm. So when we were offered this, we jumped at it immediately. Yeah. Whatever has to be done. But I want to reiterate that every transgender nonconforming child does not opt for these things. Mm -hmm. Because everyone does not look in the mirror and say, I don't like what I see. I like what I see. I just identify differently than you would have me identify. Mm -hmm. So whatever shows on my body, according to gender, I'm fine with it. My son was not, mm -hmm. okay? And I guess he was necessarily all the way non-conforming because there are transgender children, like we've already said, non-binary. Yep. I'm not choosing boy or girl. My child said I am a boy. And in some ways I was like, okay, um, it was easier for me. Once I really got to talk to families with non-binary children, and that's what I also want to add, if you want some real truth, talk to someone who is walking that path. Don't talk to people that have never even met or talk to someone mm. that is caring for or who is transgender, because I guarantee you they're telling you something that is not true. Okay. You have to know this and walk the walk to talk the talk. And even I don't even have as much information because I'm a parent. I don't walk in my child's shoes. Mm -hmm. And that's why I listen because I don't understand what it is to be in a body that you're not agreeing with yeah. or an identity that strangers told you that you are. Mm. And we opted for the medical intervention, but not all children do that. Exactly. Um, I'm going to add on to that. Yeah. Um, it kind of goes hand in hand. Um, not all children um, opt for any medical treatment. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, is understanding and respecting that if an individual doesn't opt for medical treatment, it does not make them any less of a woman or man mm -hmm. or non-binary person. Yes. Um, because everybody's transition is unique to that mm -hmm. person. That's right. My, mm -hmm. this, my decisions and my transition is different than Amina's mm -hmm. um, and that is different from Z's and mm -hmm. so on and so forth, exactly. right? Um, it's about respecting the child and respecting what they want. So if a child might be trans and you hear about puberty blockers, talk to your child about it. Mm -hmm. The same way you, you tell them, right, the same way we educate children, like consent, right? The mm. same way we teach children about how to respect, we can also teach yes. children how to make a conscious decision yeah. about what makes them feel good, because a child can understand what makes them mm. feel good. Mm. So if you talk about this, this option, don't impose it on them, because mm -hmm. again, it's not about what anybody else's idea of gender means, it's about what this child's right idea of what their gender means. If mm -hmm. that doesn't mean medical intervention, mm -hmm. then it just doesn't mean medical intervention. It just means you go with the flow and then you wait until they're older to find out what they want to do. If it means medical intervention, then you talk more about it and get as much resources as you can to teach your child or the child in your life and you know, and then you go from there. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to add on yeah, to that. Yeah. Right. And you know, I'll just say this lastly that um, when my son you know, had, a, had the word transgender, and I learned more about what that meant. Mm -hmm. When we first moved to Philadelphia, my son was very, very happy. 
and proud to finally speak his truth. Mm -hmm. So we're talking, we had every transgender flag in the world, went to the first pride, <laughs> you couldn't tell us anything. Um, but you know, it only takes society <laughs> to pop your bubble. And that's what happened to my son, because he trusted who he thought were his friends um, in elementary school. But then when we, when we went to middle school, um, and it was the case where there may have been six elementary schools, so everybody has their own people, but there's only one middle school. Mm. So once my son, who was transitioning in elementary school, said, when I go to middle school, this is my name, this is my, this, I, I am he, him, someone that he trusted told other students, mm. okay? So as a parent, I was crushed because I saw his light dim. Now, he's older and he definitely speaks his truth more. And sometimes it hurts my feelings. Like he changed his name and his middle name, right? His middle name honored my mother because my mother passed away before he was born. But even though he went back and forth, he finally said to me, it's not about you. This is my name, and this is what is going to make me feel whole. I know what you said, Mom, and I know what that represents, but let me be me. So as crushed as I was, because I take names very seriously, mm -hmm. it wasn't about me. And I want my son to be able to have that flag. I want him to join the organizations at school, but guess what? That is not my child. He is my son. I am not your transgender child. I am your son. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when we go out, I don't introduce him as my transgender son. I have four sons, period. For the sake of talking, I identify that difference. But my son, when we're in public and I do public things, he will not be there with me. Number one is too dangerous. Mm -hmm. I can be strong, but I can't protect him all the time. Yeah. And so how he defines his transgen transgender self is his way. Right. Because there's classmates in school that are very, very open with it. Hear me roar. Mm -hmm. That is not my son. He will not join organizations. It's not a shame. It's a matter of that does not define me. So that's where things differ. And every child, I promise you, is different in how they are defined. Yes, we understand he was born a girl. But that is not all of my child. And so I had to switch gears with that. So as much as I don't know what came first with his being betrayed, and now he's like, nope, he may have changed on his own anyway, mm -hmm. because it's not about waving a flag. It's about how I live. Yeah. And I had to notice the difference. Y'all yeah. okay. are so great. Thank you. Uh, we have one last question on the, um, mm. the medical side of things. Oh, yeah. And this question is, are there aspects of medical transition that adolescents cannot access until they are older? Is the informed consent process for minors different than it is for adults? Um, and again, this is from the, um, the perspective of a physician that we had at a previous panel. The caveat is I'm a pediatrician and I only work with youth up to 25 years old. I have much, much less knowledge of how it works in adult medicine. The biggest difference is for patients who have already gone through puberty, for the most part, we don't give them puberty blockers because they've already gone through puberty, and so there's no benefit. And as I mentioned, in medicine, we, in medicine, we really don't like giving medications to people if there will be no benefit. Most older patients do not get offered puberty blockers. For patients who start on puberty blockers, we start them at children doses of hormones once they are ready and decide to start hormones. We do not give them full adult doses because they've never been through puberty, so we want to take them through puberty, and puberty is not a momentary process, as we all know. In case you don't remember, it happened over the course of a few years. It's not like a switch, it's a process. So we take children through that process and slowly increase the dose of their hormones over two years to mimic what their classmates are going through. 
because we want them to be on par with their classmates and what they're going through. That's our goal. Once a patient has already gone through puberty, whether that's a 15-year-old or a 25-year-old, we just start at, an, at adult doses because there's a lot of things hormones do for you and we want to make sure they're getting their full doses. Are there treatments that are not giving that we that we are not giving children, like maybe some surgeries? That is very dependent. That is very dependent, honestly, and unfortunately, on insurance companies. Some of it is based on medical guidelines, but I think they are moving more towards what I, as an adolescent development specialist, agree with. We know development is not correlated directly to age. It's not about how many trips to the sun, around the sun you've made. This is especially true in the adolescent period. You can have two 14-year-olds in very different stages of development, so we try to take a more developmental approach to things like medication and surgery, and the medical community is moving in that direction, but not the insurance community who have age cutoffs, unfortunately. There's some but not enough advocacy to try to get the guidelines revised and then the, and get the insurance companies on board as well. Since there are no medical interventions before puberty, there are no surgeries that will be done before puberty either. I think we are sometimes criticized for not giving patients enough autonomy in young adulthood to make those decisions, like we are gatekeepers to care. And our goal in everything we do is to do no harm, so we don't want to stand between a patient and self-actualization. And surgery is no joke. Surgery has complications and a patient might not be in the right place, so we want to make sure people are ready for what's coming, and we tow a fine line between listening to the patient and also using our medical experience to guide a patient to a treatment that will be the most successful. We want to follow their lead, but we also ha have many times where we feel uh, like we have a bit of knowledge and they don't have, uh, and they don't have about what the long term looks like there. And in many cases, we aren't successful in towing that line, and in many ways, we aren't. So I'll pose the question to the panel again in case you have any thoughts. Are there aspects of medical transition that adolescents cannot access until they are older? Is the infor informed consent process for minors different than it is for adults? Um, I guess, yeah, since I um, medically transitioned from a youth, like, mm -hmm. was, I want to be very clear, was privileged enough to be able mm -hmm. to, medi to medically transition under the okay. eye of the care and the eye of a doctor um, and continue to transition as an adult. Um, so when I was a youth, the only things I, I was afforded were uh, pills. So that was uh, testosterone or hormone blockers and um, estrogen. Uh, that's all I was afforded. I wasn't able to get surgery till I was 18. Um, that's breast augmentation, um, my gender affirmation surgery, um, which is bottom surgery. Um, I wasn't and even taking injectable hormones, I wasn't able to do it until I was 18. I know yeah. some of that has changed now, mm -hmm. where teenagers are now much. taking yeah. injectable, but what are they, like 16, like, 17? Right. Like they're, so it's not that much. Yeah, they're older. Um, mm -hmm. They're like older teenagers, right. um, not really younger kids. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. Um, surgeries, I'm the youngest person I know who's had um, gender reassignment surgery was 17. Um, and that's only because they were transitioning since they were the age of seven. So there was like a long history of their transition um, socially, medically. Mind you, what is also needed as an adult, you need to have proof of at least living a year um, as the gender that you um, identify as. Mm -hmm. um, and you need the doctor's notes, therapist notes, right? <laughs> um, they're not just giving out <laughs> surgeries willy nilly like people think. Um, there is a very in-depth process. So even if somebody who was a teenager wants to get surgery, there are so many barriers that they have to overcome before they're allowed. Um, that's health insurance, that's a physician itself, um, parents, because um, to have any like top surgery, bottom surgery, you have to have consent from both um, parents if both parents have custody. Um, and if one parent has full custody, then just that one parent. Um, and if there was never a custody agreement <laughs> like uh, my mom and my father, you have to wait. Um, mm -hmm. And you have to go through the courts, mm -hmm. and then you have to relinquish rights from the other parent if the other parent doesn't, um, in this 
city of Philadelphia. If the other parent doesn't exercise parental rights in six months, they lose all parental rights. So I had to wait six months before I could get a normal <laughs> from my first doctor's visit. So understanding that there are a lot of, um, I don't want to, I don't want to say that they're barriers, but there are a lot of like steps and precautions in place mm -hmm. to make sure that people are protected um, mentally, physically, um, and things are given to the people um, of different ages, depending on like what you want. Like you said, like there's a block the, now the that implant. is an implant, mm -hmm. which is new because mm -hmm. they didn't offer me that as a child. <laughs> um, but then there's also things like patches yeah. and gels and needles and pills. Um, I like gels I like too, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, especially around certain health. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> so there are so many different options uh, for individuals, but for the most part, for children, um, for the children that I know, the youth that I know, it's mostly just a pill. It's mostly mm -hmm. pills. Yeah which makes it very reversible so yeah. yes mm -hmm. so it just gives them this opportunity to see uh how their body will develop um you know as they're going through this like and is that a word androgenic process <laughs> um, um so that's really all it is so you're going to hear a lot of you know anti-trans anti-queer extremists talk about like, oh, the doctors are in on it. They're, you know, forming a cabal with the Democrats to bring the alien <laughs> lizard people to the planet and make everybody queer and trans and make all of our children go through these life-changing drastic surgeries. But I'll go into more detail with the next set of questions because people are crazy. There we go. Everybody likes my soothing voice. Anything they do. <laughs> and we, you know, going through this with my son, this is, no one takes this lightly. Right. Mm -hmm. So we went through so much before we even got the blockers. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> um, it wasn't about because my son said something and the doctor said, yeah, let's just go ahead and do this. No, uh, it, it took time because you have to make sure you're doing the right thing in the interest of the child. Exactly. So, and like I said, children can change their minds. Let me also say this, it is not contagious. And my child, when he went to school and still goes to school, he is not having secret meetings in the basement of the school <laughs> to make everybody transgender. Okay, but it, we laugh, but this is People what really is being know, said. I know. Yes. I know. You know, my son <laughs> didn't come home and I raced to the school to see who had the transgender trait. <laughs> or who had the transgender clothes on. This is just who he is. And he was so consistent. This is like this, like even to hear these things is very, very dangerous because children are not living to be adults because of this nonsense. Yeah. Nadine. I hate Sorry. to break it to you. All of us trans people have little numbers on the back of our heads that y'all can't. No, I'm messing exactly. with you. <laughs> yeah, because I'm checking my sign. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen any numbers. Okay, I just see dirt. And since I'm an elder trans person, we still have the Roman numerals. <laughs> yes, we do. It's, it's just ridiculous. You know, but I will say it again, and I, I know that my sisters at this table are right behind me. Mm -hmm. We are talking about people's lives. Yeah. So we need to stop being so obsessed with the bedroom mm. and oh my God, that's nasty. Oh my goodness, it's not normal. No, you're not normal <laughs> because this is what being a human being is. And this is nothing that is new. It's that okay. is what is so ridiculous. <laughs> this has been going on long before any of us were a twinkle in our parents' eyes. Or okay. their parents. Exactly. Or theirs. Mm. <laughs> you know, Say so, that. you know, people have to get their, their information straight. Mm -hmm. No pun intended. <laughs> Sorry. But, <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm straight it's cisgender, and let me tell you something. This is the best thing that's happened to my small world. Because when it doesn't have anything to do with you, you just keep on going. There you go. Mm -hmm. You know, did I treat people wrong because of who they were? No. But it just, 
is something else when you see a child handle the weight of th this world mm. on their shoulders and you have adults that do not care how they are hurting children, okay. how they're hurting fellow parents. I don't care if you are a parent and your children are cis, hetero, they're just perfect soccer player, you got two dogs <laughs> and half a fence. Okay. Congratulations. That's really, yes, congratulations. That's really, really sweet. That's cute. But I tell parents all the time, all of your children are not cisgender. They're not. They just don't want to tell you. Okay. I'll leave it there. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thank you all. Um, we're going to move into one last set of questions. Um, These are the fun ones. <laughs> these questions directly address common concerns and misconceptions. Mm -hmm. And the first is, how do we know that trans kids really are trans? How can we trust that they're able to decide for themselves? Mm -hmm. Amina, yeah, are you a I black woman? I got it. Hold on, I got it. No, no. In fact, we're going to both do this. Oh. Come on. You pull okay. up. Yes. Go, Go on. Are you a black woman? Yes, I am. Yeah. Okay. Well, there we go. Yeah, see, simple as that. Like, that. How do you know? I, like when people say that, like, well, how do kids know? Um, because they do. Thank you. Okay. Because they do. It's important. It's okay to listen to your kids. It's okay. And when we start treating our children, our youth, like people, instead of like these empty shells that we need to pour everything into and you've got to grow up and y'all know the saying, until you start paying bills and taking care of children of your okay. own, you don't get to make no decisions. I still ain't got no children. <laughs> I'm grown as hell. But what I've noticed is that when people ask those questions, especially my favorite, how can we trust that they're able to decide for themselves? No, the, the question is, why can't you? Mm. Now, why can't you trust that they can't make a decision for themselves? Mm -hmm. Why not? Why not? Mm. Like, why can't you trust them? And it speaks to this language of how we describe children, how we describe how they exist uh, you know, in this world around adults. Oh, they don't know anything. Oh, the, even with media, they demonize children, especially during that you know, prepubescent interpuberty into their teenage years. They turn them into these like emotionless, crass, arrogant monsters. And I'm like, no, that's my personality and I'm in my 40s, what are you talking <laughs> about? Like, it's a great. So we have to start pulling back and you, like introspecting and saying, wait a minute, mm -hmm. no, why don't I trust mm -hmm. that my child can make a decision like this? And more importantly, what is keeping me from listening to them? Um, mm -hmm. So to give context on why I looked at Amina and asked Amina if she was black, it's the way that Amina knows that she's a black woman <laughs> is the way that children know that they're trans, right? It's, it's fact, it's evidence, right? It's it's not unreal. Um, so this is kind of jumping, kind of like to 10 a little bit. But um, the reason we know it's fact and it's real is because nobody is going to turn around and say, I'm trans, and I want to get bullied, and I want the world to treat me like I am less than a human and have less rights federal rights than dogs, because trans people have less federal rights than dogs. Um, let's be real, uh, right? I, I want to have less rights. I want to be bullied. I want to be tormented. I want to have body dysphoria. Children do not want that. Children want to be children. Children want to have fun. They want to play in the dirt and the mud and with toys and right and do all the things that kids do. And when they're telling you that they're trans, it's because they're telling you, hey, I'm giving you a heads up <laughs> that I'm going to be a girl or a boy or just a person when I'm older. Not what y'all thought I was going to be. Mm -hmm. And that is as true as true can be. And I want to bring up something Nadine said earlier. It is ageous to sit here and think that a child cannot make a decision for themselves. If we teach children how to have respect, mm. if we teach children consent, if we teach children how to tie their shoes and how to match the clothes properly, properly, and they decide not to respect, if 
They look at consent and say, I'm going to let this other person hold my hands, right? If that's what they do, if, right, anything that you taught them how to do, they had of a choice whether or not to do it. It is the same thing with their gender. Yep. Why can't that, they make <laughs> that decision? Mm -hmm. Like, that decision is very important for them to make um, and for them to live. Because at the end of the day, um, this is fact, and people feel however they want to feel. When y'all gone, y'all gone. These kids are going to continue to live. So either let them live how they need to live now or have them live miserable and know that when you go on to whatever you believe in, heaven, um, the afterlife, get reincarnated, whatever you believe in, just know that if you have them living miserable until you get to wherever that other place is and then they have to come out after you pass away, that means you failed. You felt as a human, and you felt as a parent, you felt mm -hmm. as a caregiver, as a guardian, whoever you are, you felt. And I, I also, you know, I know what, you know, my sisters are saying. This is not even a decision. This is what it is. Yeah. My son did not wake up. Let me just go upset my mom today. Because, you know, she has that jewelry, and let me just rock her world. Okay. Because she was so happy I got here. Now she got this. Yeah, jewelry. it's Tuesday. I think this is time to really <laughs> see how far I can go with my mom. Mm -mm. And I knew that he, you know, because now, you know, what is it? Uh, 2020 vision? Yes. You know, hindsight is 2020. Hindsight is 2020. Because then I saw, wow, I missed all those signs. Mm. So, my child was already going through, I don't know, and feeling his way out long before he was six years old. So now things made sense. So it just got to a point, and we were blessed that for my child, it was like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. But many children, they keep going through this. Okay. And again, once I have my children, and no, I did not think this when I had my first child who was good and grown. But man, did I finally see, once I birth my child, again, my job is to protect and model as best I can. Mm -hmm. Not to make you what I need you to be so that I feel good. Mm -hmm. And that is the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, I tripped along the way. I made mistakes. I've used the wrong pronoun. I've slipped. I've cried, I've yelled, I've cursed. Mm -hmm. But after all is said and done, when I realized I did not lose my child, my child is still good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm more than blessed because of it, because I am such a better human being. I was a better educator. And that is why, you know, I love being around these good people, sorry, it's I really okay. do, because <laughs> in our schools we are doing such, such damage. Mm. And I'm just being honest. And I know yeah. my face is out here, my name is out here, but if I'm, I'm not going to lie anymore. We are destroying children. Yeah. So I'm talking unapologetically, loudly, sassily, and so people understand, get yourself together or get out. Yeah. Because counselors don't understand, teachers don't understand. And I know teachers don't get any type of respect. I've been there doing this for so long. So it definitely wasn't for the money. <laughs> and I'm still going to do it because we have work to do. Because yeah. children are dying, just so you know. Mm -hmm. Because they have nowhere to go. And to me, that is a great, great failure. So that is why it hurts so much when you see grown A people that do not care and make these laws willy nilly. Like, what, what are you doing? Yeah. Would you do that to your child? And we never think in that way. Right. Because that's those other people. That's that yucky part of our society. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of those yuckies is in your house. My mother thought the same thing. She said, oh, that's not going to happen to any of my kids. Mm. And I was her first child. And my godmother said to her, there go your daughter right there. 
You ain't got to try no more. And she hated her for it for years, mm. knowing it was the truth. So imagine all that denial my mother was living with. So if you need any advice, love your children because mm-hmm. you don't want them to end up like me. The only thing that kept me from not committing suicide the many times I tried is because I refused to give a family that hated me for no reason at all the satisfaction to tell somebody else their version of my story. Mm -hmm. So if me living every day in front of their face makes them hate me even more, I tell them to eat it. Mm -hmm. Because every single piece of womanhood that I have earned for myself, I worked hard for it, I bled for it, I almost died for it. Twice, because I'm worth it, my future is worth it, and I was determined to live my dream. It is your job as the people in these, in these children's lives to let them know we're going to live this dream together. I love you, I see you, and I hear you, and I respect you. Mm. Your children are deserving of that. Mm. They deserve it. All right, we just have a couple more questions here. Um, and they're all very related. So this is just going to kind of continue on the, the thought that I think we, we've been having. So is it possible for social media, peer pressure, or an adult to influence the gender identity of a young person? And we did receive some questions in advance that kind of touched on this subject. So yeah. mm-hmm. did you want to? I can read. A, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so one person in advance asked um, if social media can make a young person identify as trans and seek puberty blockers. And then another person, and I'll read this one. um, Is it possible that my child is confused? My child has a close friend who is transgender. Could my child be feeling this way due to peer pressure or wanting to fit in or be like their friend? Could my child feel pressured by a society that if they aren't transgender, they don't fit in? Can I please? Yes, go. So so these are my absolute favorite. So (laughs) I'm just going to prop this up a little bit so everybody can hear me. Oh, okay. So so these are my favorites. So Susan, first of all, hi and welcome. Um, so uh, what we are noticing, especially with social media, with, uh, with these communities that are building, is that our young people today are getting something that we growing up did not experience, which is Um, a community already existing of people who have been through what they've been through. So I think there is a confusion or a disconnect between, so it's like, oh, they must be influenced. No, what they found is community. What they found is someone saying, oh, we have those feelings too. This is what that is called. This may be you, it may not be you. One of my jobs is to make sure that I'm paying attention to what young people are talking about so that my training modules can reflect what young people are talking about today in reference to their experiences. And one thing that they've always been grateful for, and I'm talking as far back as the Tumblr era, that it lets you know that I'm pretty internet savvy, okay? So <laughs> what they've always been real big on is building these, like these sub online communities. So. Uh, there's not like a whole roaring like, oh, come here, join us in our chat group, we're trans. It starts as um, talking about anime, talking about uh, like identifying with furry communities, talking about certain cartoons, talking about comic books, like, and then them being able to exchange that information and talking about how they identify with certain characters and go, actually, this is something I've been feeling all of the time. What they're doing is building community about understanding all of the facets of their identity. So it's not just about them being trans, not just about them uh, being gender nonconforming, non-binary, gender queer, gender fluid. It's really about saying, wow, I had these feelings all the time and I'm not alone. And believe it or not, as expansive as we become with technology, with these different ways that we access uh, talking to people and, and interfacing with people, there's still young people who feel alone, like they're the only ones who have this feeling, they're the only ones who have this identity. So actually through social media, what's happened is they have found community peers, people who are most times their age, saying, oh, you feel this way too? Oh, well, I read up on something, so they're exchanging information. They're doing their research. This is them going out, finding out scientific information, things that were not easily accessible to me coming Uh up. So here it is. I'm trying to understand gender transitioning. I'm going through puberty at 13. I start growing like 
like breast tissue at that age. So there's a lot of other stuff genetically that's going on and trying to figure out what trans, like what gender transitioning looks like for me. All I had was books and most of them were probably very dated and had very topical, <laughs> okay. sometimes highly stereotypical, albeit medical like books about what transgenderism, transsexualism was. And that was the best that I had here they have this whole other sea of information that really helps them define what it is that they're feeling, what it is that they're going through, and they have people who are their age who they can talk to about this, so they're actually growing up understanding these gender identities together. However, should we still be mindful of adults and their influence? Absolutely. What I want people to understand is, is that Adults harming children is very clear. There is no need for an extra hashing out of what their sexuality is, what their gender identity is. Once we understand that, that, oh, it's different when a young girl or someone who is perceived as a girl is molested versus a boy, because I've heard that talk a lot when we talk about a male, older male influence, oh, well, he must be gay. No, what he is is a predator. What these people are are predators, whether they rape boy children or girl children, they are predators. So this is the same for people who influence folks to be transgender, because actually there's more to it than that. So, oh, I've got an interesting story. Are you ready for a story? I've got a story. So one thing about me growing up in the 90s, God, I'm so old. So growing up in the 90s and being a young trans person is that one thing that I noticed in my community is that there were a lot of unhealed queer and trans adults in our community. So this is why it's important to love your kids because then when you give them pain as children, mm. they inflict pain as adults on mm. other children. They are jealous of their innocence, of their youth because so much of that was taken away from them when they were children. Mm. So there was an instance where there was this uh, adult who would make younger like boys who looked more feminine. Oh, you need to be up in drag, you need to be doing this, you need to be doing that. And why we put a stop to it? Not because of, oh, you're trying to make them transgender. No, what you're doing is getting them into sex trafficking and you need to be in jail. Yeah. So that's when we start pinpointing it and looking at it for the crime that it is, not trying to even sexualize the crime that is being committed. That is when we can have a clear understanding of, under, of understanding the journey of sexuality, understanding the journey of gender identity. This doesn't mean that we're not supposed to be aware of the kinds of influences our children are receiving, but really having a clear cut understanding of the difference between crimes being committed and our young people finding community with people who are like them. Because that is something that was not afforded to us when we were coming up. We were reared into things a certain way. You hung out with these kind of people. That was the way of the world. That was tradition. Because tradition is easy. Let's be clear about it. Tradition is easy. Well, you don't have to veer away from the norm. If it's a straight line, there's a saying that when everybody has the same path, nobody gets lost. Mm. So why are there still deviations? Okay. Because human existence is expansive. But we do need to pay attention, yes, to the harms that people bring to our children and understand when our child is trying to find community and build community with people who are like them. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna answer this. <laughs> Yeah. Sure, please, yes. <laughs> Um, my son, my son came to me about a year or so ago and he, he wanted to sit me down on the couch and he said, how would you feel if I told you I was bi? I think he said, I said, okay. And he said, really, you're okay with that? I said, I am okay with that. I love you. I said, I'm always going to love you. I said, no matter who you love, how many people you love, I don't care as long as he's happy. I want him here. Okay. And, um. He was so, the relief that came on his face, like it was just, wow. And he, the smile, and um, that was huge. And I was, uh -huh. I was so grateful that he told me. We're super close, he and I were. were uh -huh. <laughs> everybody at school even knows how close we are, like the principals and everything. We're super close. He's the most amazing human being. Take your time. Yeah, take your time. <laughs> He's kind. He's accepting. Perfect. So, but the reason that it's so fearful to me, he only said this to me a couple months ago that um, something about trans. I said, okay. 
And like, okay, as long as he is here on the planet, that's what I care about. Mm -hmm. My fear is because the part that I'm not saying is that he has autism. Aww. So he has autism, he has anxiety, he has a little ADHD, and that's my fear. And I said to him, Nikki, I said, I, I don't care who you love, how many people you love, whatever. I said, my fear for you is the world because the world's mm -hmm. mean, the world's nasty, people are horrible behind their computer. That's my mm -hmm. fear for you. Mm -hmm. There's computer cowboys, mm -hmm. and please don't put anything on social media. Um, that's my fear because I don't want him to be, oh, there's that boy with autism. Now he's, I don't know how you word it, he's transgender. Mm -hmm. And that's my fear. And all I can think is, like, somebody hurting I'm, baby. A, I'm so scared for him. Mm -hmm. And I told him he knows how I feel. Like, he knows I don't care who you love. I don't care who you are. I want you here and happy. That's my biggest fear. I don't want him depressed. And I say to him, like, hanging from the roof. Some, like, you know what I mean? I need him here, and I don't care who he is, what he is, but how do I make him safe out there? Like, he's in high school now, and he has, here he is, the autism. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. Sorry. I, I I don't no, know. don't apologize. Don't apologize. I actually, can I come Yeah. And he's so awesome, too, with it. Like, we just love him. We tell him, like, we don't care. You know? So... I'm a librarian here at the Free Library, and I'm also transgender. Mm -hmm. I'm like the one librarian who kind of coordinated this. And I'm autistic. I'm an autistic adult. Aww. I grew up gender nonconforming and autistic. And I got, you know, I got bullied a lot. You know, people are like, oh, you're, you know, you're such a, you're so weird or sissy, all that stuff. Um, I turned out fine. <laughs> My parents actually, you know, they're not in the picture now. So I'm not as lucky as your kid is. I have a master's degree and I work for the library and I organize this whole event and I'm doing fine. Uh, you know, think about autistic kids as they grow up to be autistic adults and even if the development is different, they still develop and grow. You know, even if you take longer to learn social skills, they'll learn social skills, it happens and you can help. And it is a thing among the autistic community that we know there's a lot more trans people mm. and queer people in the autistic community than in the general population. So you'll, like, you know, if your kid finds other autistic adults as friends, there's gonna be no, no like, like lack of other mm -hmm. queer autistic people to be friends with who will like get it <laughs> entirely. There's like so many of us. Yeah. And the main theory, and this is not scientifically backed because there's been no studies on this yet, but the main theory we have is that gender is a social norm just like every other social norm that autistic people don't internalize that well. Uh, right, and for the same reason that autistic people have a lot more difficulties with like indirect speech or idioms is like also why we don't, as kids, pick up on as much of like, this is how boys are supposed to behave. To me, I didn't know something was how a boy's supposed to behave until someone specifically said to me, oh, you're a boy and boys do that. And I went, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't pick up on that at all. And so that just makes it easier when you like aren't what you've been assigned to be like, well, I'm already weird. It doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make any more sense to me than any of these other things. I don't understand why people are mad at me all the time. I don't understand these jokes. And I don't understand this gender thing. Uh, so it just makes it a lot easier to just kind of be like, I'm not going to do the gender thing that's been assigned to me because I don't like it and I don't understand it. And I'll be happier when I just do what I want to do, which is, I think, what you've probably observed in your own kid is how everything else is as well, you know. Autistic kids grow up and they don't stop liking the things they liked as little kids because they're like, I don't know why I should stop. <laughs> so your kid's gonna be fine, <laughs> It's what I'm trying to say, uh, especially because it sounds like they have a really good mom. Um, and if you're worried about how they're gonna grow up, you know, yeah, bullying will happen, but that's why you have parents and that's why people learn and it's our life. Um, it's not going to destroy their life. There's a lot of us out there in the community, and you're not alone either, right? Like, mm -mm. there are communities of people. Um, there's a whole organization called ASON, Autistic Self Advocacy Network, and that organization is like full of queer autistic adults and like trans autistic adults who would like, if you reached out and you're like, how do I support my trans autistic teenager? They're gonna be like, oh, I'm so happy that you asked. I have a million <laughs> opinions on this because they're autistic adults, so they're not gonna shut up. Uh, so that's what I have to say. <laughs> I wasn't planning on speaking at all. There's a whole lot. No, thank, thank you. But I wasn't thank expecting you. something so personal to come up. I'm going to yeah, return this microphone and the panel can speak to it because they're the experts. And one more thing. Your child is perfect. Period. Aww. He's definitely perfect. And, and 
absolutely. And you remind them of that every day. I know you do. I can feel it from here. Mm -hmm. So from somebody who wished they had that, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I had a quick question. Um, are there pronouns he, him, or she, her? Are there pronouns he, him, or she, her? Be patient, right? yeah. <laughs> and he's, he's like, okay, cool, whatever. But I don't know what he said. I mean, he came into my room the other night, sorry, and he had this girl at school gave him a shirt, and he was so proud to come into my room. He had this black shirt on, and it was sheer, and it had ruffles, and he had his Villanova pajama bottoms on. And he came in my room, he was waiting for me, I said, hi, great. You just talked to me because you were watching the Phillies game. And he's just like, <laughs> see that face, to see like the joy of me just being like, you're, you're Nikki, you're Nikki, you know what I'm saying? I don't care, you're Nikki, like just to see that, you know what I'm saying? Yep. Yeah. And when mm -hmm. he talks to us, the relief, and he's, he goes from this to just, that's like, amazing. Like, it. like I can't even like, he's our, uh, he's our, he's everything. That's I don't it. Know what to but <laughs> 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 yeah. The thing you said was, it's, it's not about me. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a sad. yeah. I have to be honest about it. I have, he's not going to do that. It's you know, and that's something I believe is not about me, and I do realize that. So, so mm -hmm. um, and I, I say this for I haven't experienced being a parent yet, but from what my mom said, and it's similar to you, it's you mourn, yeah. you mourn the child that you had, and then you gain the child that you never had, is how my mom explains mm -hmm. it to me. Because um, when you're handed the blue blanket, right, you automatically, like, you have all these dreams, and you have all these achievements you hope that your child accomplishes, right? And then when your child comes to you and goes, well, actually, <laughs> The blue blanket meant nothing. <laughs> they got confused. It should have been a pink blanket. Um, no, um, I was I was asking because um, I read the question. And can I say where you're from? Because it's in the question. If you don't, yeah. Okay, so it says you're from Port Richmond. And <laughs> no, I, I'm saying this because um, I understand why you're saying you're scared. Because you you live in Port Richmond. I live in Kensington. I'm born and raised in Kensington. <laughs> so you're not too far from Kensington, and a lot of the kids do intertwine from Port Richmond and Kensington. Um, being in high school is difficult for anyone, for anyone, right? Mm -hmm. It's all the awkward stages, all you know, the weird conversations, um, and remember, because I, I want you to feel very good. Remember, when you were in high school, it felt like everything was so important. And you got out of high school, and you probably don't talk to half the people you talked to in high school, and now you live this life that has nothing to do with high school. And that's exactly what Nikki's going to experience. Nothing in high school is going to be permanent for Nikki. Nikki is going to grow up and be an amazing person. They're already an amazing person, right? They're going to be even a more amazing person. Um, Especially because you, as a parent, like you're here. Mm -hmm. There, there's so many parents who should be here right now, here in Philadelphia. You came all the way to Center City. You said, "I'm going to this. <laughs> I'm going to ask my question. <laughs> I'm going to let it be known that I want to do whatever I can for my child." Um, your question said, "Would your child feel left out?" Um, if they were cisgender and they were transgender kids. I want to reiterate what Amina said, was it's about community. Mm -hmm. It is all about community. It's Nobody feels left out, right? If it's a cisgender person, transgender person, a cisgender person won't feel left out. Um, understanding that we live in a world that was built for cisgender people, right? Know that cisgender people get a lot more privileges than trans people, right? Mm -hmm. We understand that. Um, and we make community everywhere we go, 
right? So cis folk make their own community. And it's the same thing with trans folks. There are things that like me and Amina can joke about and laugh about. And we do. Yes, and we do. <laughs> we call it a key. <laughs> that we key about, right? And then Nadine's here. And we can laugh and joke, but it's not ever going to be the same way that me and Amina would laugh and joke. So Nikki's friends, you might notice, are more trans people because it's the people who Nikki can laugh and joke and relate to because Nadine doesn't know what I'm going through. Nadine doesn't feel the way that I feel, right? Nadine is a cisgender person, I'm a transgender person. So automatically, you would assume that my friend <laughs> would be, right, would be Amina, right? Um, and then once a person feels completely comfortable and confident, right, because um, then you'll start seeing that their friends will start expanding, right? But right now in this age of development, it's going to be who you look like, who you act like, who makes you feel good about you in this world. Nobody wants to be around people who are <laughs> not going to make them feel good about themselves, right? Um, so just want to let you know that it's it has nothing to do with um, feeling left out or feeling like there isn't right feeling like oh this person's trans and that person's trans and man because if they want to be friends with somebody we live in a world again that has been built for cis people the, you wouldn't need to want to feel trans, right? Because this world is built for you as a cis person. Um, and just reiterate that so you know that this is how Nikki feels. And you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing by yeah. being here, so thank you. And thank you for sharing, you know, allowing yourself to be vulnerable. That, you know, and I get it. And just know that you're gonna go through that. And it's normal and you should not feel guilty. Mm -hmm. It's natural. You know, when we become parents, so please, just when we come out the womb, we're already set up. Mm -hmm. You're set up with other people's expectations. You, we, we don't know where we begin and where we end. Mm. I don't know if I'm the woman I am because I defined it or my parents did. May they rest in peace, right? But I know a lot of their stuff is in me. Mm -hmm. So unlearning is a fun thing. And you are doing wonders. You're not doing anything wrong. And, you know, the communities are, you know, that is what, like, has been said. We didn't have that. And, I mean, even my son, um, who the, his, is not out, okay, he is just who he is in the new school. Because we had to move from Philadelphia to Jersey mm -hmm. uh, because it got so bad. This is the second time I've moved out of the state to protect my child. And, um, you, know, he's, you know, he's in social media and these different rooms, and they actually have discussions mm -hmm. on these things. And I, it just blows my mind. Like, wow, you're really having some really good talks. And you know what, this subject has come up. Are, you know, are my peers just trying to be cool mm -hmm. and say they're transgender? And they actually talk these things through. But when, when I was a child, it wasn't even this type of intellectual type of discourse okay. about sexuality or identity. It was a matter of, okay, did you do it? Yeah. Are you going to do it? Just real base crap. <laughs> okay. But they're actually having some real talks. <laughs> I can still remember the ABC after school special. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. That's how I learned stuff. But now they're, you know, they're pushing the envelope. Mm -hmm. You know, it's adults that I can't stand as a teacher. Children have, they're clayable, and they get it. They learn the garbage from the adults who are just, mm -hmm. they're just, they can't move. Mm -hmm. And that, there will come a, a point because your child is gonna be so like, wow, I have the bomb diggity parents. Mm -hmm. I'm talking slowly because I usually curse. So <laughs> let me just keep going. I'm being very good today. Yes, because there's children, and I, you know, it's hard for me, but. And we love to be. Yes, we do. We um, but I share with my child yeah. that I missed that. And we went through pictures, and I asked permission, what can I keep? What can I still have out in the home? Because I have to be honest, too. 
I love you. I love you to life. I wouldn't even change what's going on. Just understand I was set up. And I have these plans. Mm -hmm. Because I was my mom's daughter who was with the jewelry mm -hmm. and the lady and the girly type of stuff. Even though I'm girly when I want to be. And when I want to wear a hat and wear my jeans and a t-shirt, I do that too. Mm -hmm. You know, the bald head. I'm automatically told, you know, I'm some things. And it's like, okay, whatever. Okay. That's your definition. That's none of my business. <laughs> okay. I know what I like at home. Mm -hmm. And I'll leave it there. There you go. Right? Okay. 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 So you, you're amazing. Yes. And you're following your child's lead. So trust me, those imbeciles out there don't have a chance. Okay. Because your child already knows, I got a team. I got a strong team. That's right. They said mom so and dad just, here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's one step at a time. And you know, if and this is for everybody here because I know that y'all are here because y'all genuinely care about your children. You love them. And you want to make sure that they are all right out here. And that's one thing I hear all the time, mm -hmm. like from parents who really have like their best interests at heart. First thing they say is, I'm worried about what's going to happen to my child out there. Mm -hmm. Once my mom broke down like all of the, the denial she was living in, like the, the prejudice and all that, what it really boiled down to is we grew up in North Philly. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm talking, you know, post the destruction of Raymond Rosen, okay. North Philly, where it was speakeasies on every corner. I grew up in that North Philly. Okay. So my mother was genuinely afraid mm -hmm. that one of these days I would be sitting out on the step just being me and somebody killed me right on my doorstep just mm -hmm. for me being who I am. Mm -hmm. That was a real fear. Mm -hmm. But I told her that it is important for us to build community. So I know what fears y'all holding on to. Mm -hmm. Y'all looking at some warriors here on this table. Mm -hmm. So if the love that y'all are pouring into your children isn't enough and this world want to get even fiercer, call us. We'll take okay. care of them. Because I think what's most important with us as people trying to guide our children, our young people, into the future safely and with love poured into them is that we build a united front against the people who are constantly going to resist and say, oh, that doesn't align with my belief system and, and, and this is not right and this isn't what so-and-so says. The only thing that matters here on this earth while you're living in this flesh is how you love, mm -hmm. how you give love, okay. how you receive love. Everything else that happens after you leave this place and you go in the ground, that is between you and whatever meets you on the other side. And we don't okay. have a guarantee of whatever's going to meet us. So the only thing that you can do while you are here is the good that you can do in this flesh. That is what matters. That is what counts. And that is what your child is going to remember. So keep on loving them. Mm -hmm. They need you. Mm -hmm. I know sometimes they get older, because I did, and act like you don't need your parents. Oh, I can make my own decisions. <laughs> you can't tell me nothing. Let me tell you now, as somebody who lived on these streets in the cold and wished they could call their mother, knowing that she wouldn't pick up the phone and she wouldn't talk to me, we need you. Mm -hmm. We love you more than we say a lot of times. We need you. Keep loving us. And I say us because there's still a piece of that child in me that has not yet been healed. Oh, I'm mm -hmm. still working. Of course. Okay. Keep loving us because we need you. We've always needed you. Mm -hmm. And what y'all are doing today, simply being here so you can find a way to, to make that love work, to pour that love into your child the right way, that they're always going to remember this day. Mm -hmm. Always. Mm -hmm. They're never going to forget how you said, you know what? This is something that I need. Mm -hmm. This is something that we need. Mm -hmm. This is what my family needs. They're never going to forget that, mm -hmm. ever. And Susan, I have the same fears. Mm -hmm. You know, I now have to have a discussion when we talk about schools for college, what states you cannot go in. Baby I'm sorry. Listen. It doesn't matter if <sighs> when you turn 18, they'll leave you alone. No, they won't. Mm -mm. And it gets I'm, worse. you know, I, but I also cannot be uh, paralyzed by fear yeah. because my son's going to be okay. Yeah. And because of 
you know, children don't let you know, just like as a teacher, you think the student hates you for the whole year. And then for some reason, that child that couldn't stand the ground you walked on hugs you with tears mm. at graduation. And my son is definitely in his teenage years where I can't stand him. But I love him, okay? But I can't stand him most of the time more because it has nothing to do, you know, it has nothing to do with trans. He's just a, 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 a blah, 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 right? But I know that, you know, from the start, I was on his team and he's going to be okay because it is scary yeah. because our children, they do feel they're invincible and they do go mm -hmm. in like a deer in headlights, mm -hmm. you know, but I have to let him live yeah. and, you know, I would like for him to stay in Jersey and go to school, but he's not. He's already made it very clear that you're too close. What? Two hours? That's too close. Why would wow. I go to Rowan? No. <laughs> yeah. don't, don't go there. Okay, bye. Don't even say that. Not even. Um, no, no, you know what? Hush. I don't even go through this right now. I'm going to break down crying. Okay. No, I don't want to talk about it. Okay. okay. Thanks. So, you know. As a cisgender woman, I know of my privilege, you know, and really, really going back to what was so eloquently said up here, there's no way in the world that my black daughter would have said, hey, let me be a black male in the United States of America. What? Okay, okay you might as well just walk in the middle of 95. <laughs> Okay, on the wrong side of the highway. Baby, listen. Okay. okay. Right. <laughs> but that, you know, that's what it is. And, you know, I have to believe he's going to be okay because we're doing the right thing. And, you know, especially when we're talking about, you know, look how, look how this wonderful things happen. Shelly, I, I didn't even know her story. Mm. And I appreciate that. And, you know, I don't care, Shelly, so I deal with it. Love you too. Um, you know, we're looking at neurodivergence, exactly. which I took courses on. That affects so many people, and we're finding that many of our transgender children exactly. are in that spectrum. This spectrum keeps coming up. So it's not just about autism. It's not just about this. It is just, okay, where are you? Where you probably have more, you are more aligned with things that people that are so structured and robotic have a fix on. No, I'm just vibing off of life. Yeah. And this is how I understand things. That's glorious, them being all stiff bag and you don't even know what life is. I'm gonna shut up because after I just said stiff bag, you about a to curse word's gonna come. You about to come. <laughs> yep. I, see, I, well, to, I heard it coming. You about this to might be a good time actually because we are running uh, a little okay. short on oh, time. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, okay. We do have one more prepared question left, but I think I'd rather um, just check with the audience and see if you all have yes, any questions please. to ask. Um, yeah. I do have a question. Let me get you a mic. Hold on. Hi. Hi. So, I'm a mother, <laughs> and I'm kind of just a little bit disappointed that I just read in the children's library about gender, and at this age, I'm learning about intersex. Oh. When I had health in high school, and oh. I don't remember that in the curriculum. So now mm. it's opening up my mind to the fact that it's not just men wanting to be women or women deciding that they're men. You know, it's more than that. Mm -hmm. And mm. I would like you all to speak to that a little bit more. Oh, sure. sure. Um, you gonna go? Of course. Okay. So, um, so this is something that comes up in a lot of my professional development trainings. So this is why, God, I wish we had a projector because I've got slides. <laughs> so, <laughs> so actually, what I would like to do, even after I answer this question, I'm going to speak with you after this is done. And I'm actually going to email you one of my training modules free of charge that actually talks about the many different kinds of variations of people who are born intersex and where that comes from. 
So the reason, first I want to talk about why we didn't learn that in sex ed, and that is because even our medical system was wow. completely overly invested in even a sexual binary, even when they had medical evidence that there was more than one assigned uh, gender at birth. And part of the reason, and this is just my theory, is that if this world as we knew it found out that far more of us fit into one of those variations of, uh, of intersexuality uh, by birth, it would probably split their lids. Mm -hmm. But most times, like transsexualism, transgenderism, it was looked at as this sort of parody. The term we're mostly used to is, uh, you know, the derogatory term hermaphrodite, mm -hmm. which was uh, supposedly to describe an intersex person. And most times, they thought that the long and short of someone being intersex was that on their physical or secondary sexual characteristics, they were like ambiguous, meaning the person would have what some would call like both parts, but it's actually far, far more complex than that. There are internal uh, anomalies that happens with people who are intersex, and there's some information on that as well. But part of the reason why we didn't learn it in high school is because even our medical systems were dedicated to people just thinking that there are only two sexes and that's all you need to know. But there have been people who were you know, reportedly being born intersex for several decades, and it just took for people to go and take that extra step back then to find out their education. So I'm actually glad that that stuff is coming out now because more parents who, uh, more individuals who are uh, birthing uh, children who are intersex are allowing mm -hmm. the child mm -hmm. to live in that body and make the decision for themselves as opposed to several decades ago when uh, this particular occurrence would be visible at birth, the parents would make the decision in this way that was said to them would be corrective surgery. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's probably why that was coming up. But intersex simply means it is an amalgamation of what is seen to be the standard variations of male and female. But this can be external or internal. So Thanks. I'll have more information for you after this is done. I'll see Thank you. Thanks. You're um, welcome. I did and, you know, I'll even say the unfortunate thing is health is still horrible. Yeah. Because uh, when my when certain people in the elementary school knew about my son's transitioning, he was not allowed to be in the, you know, they separate still. Why is it that a, a, a girl presenting does not need to know about a boy's body and vice versa? Because, I mean, eventually you're gonna know about that and you need to know about the, uh, you know, about body parts. So both videos were sent home with him because they don't want to teach the, so, the binary together. Right. So um. that is very crucial about the intersex because that is more common than people know. Mm -hmm. And it was a horrible time when it was almost mandated, you make a decision right now if they were ex external. Exactly. And then they wouldn't even tell the child. Mm -mm. So then later when the child is wondering mm -hmm. what is going on, it's because other people made the decision to tell you what you are. Yeah. Exactly. But there are many intersex individuals mm -hmm. living as is. Mm -hmm. But so. again, it will blow people's mind to know, wait a minute, there's more than that. Oh my God, it yes, could be me. Exactly, mm -hmm. um, Th there's something wrong. So. But health still health class is still not caught up as it should yeah. because the children should not be taught differently. And some schools won't even go into it as far as sex ed. But then we have all this other crap going on. And then you okay. wonder if you would have educated from the beginning. Hello. We already, we already know. And I'm not going to talk the politics. It's just it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You um, know, and that's the danger in it. It's also very important to note that intersex folks are as common as twins yes. and individuals born with red hair. Yes. So yes. for as many pair of twins as you see, is as many intersex folks mm -hmm. as you see. And I just want to, I know you're going to give her a little bit more information, mm -hmm. but for other folks, um, it's external genitalia, mm -hmm. internal reproductive system, mm -hmm. yes. uh, chromosomes, yeah. and hormones. Yeah. Um, those are all the things that identify um, an individual's sex assigned at birth. 
Uh, and a lot of times doctors never perform ultrasounds on babies. Yes. Um, they don't check chromosomes on babies, right? Um, they, they do hormone levels, right, when they do the blood. Um, yeah, yeah. But- um, they, yeah, they, yeah. Don't really pay attention. Um, they only pay attention when it's like uh, breast growth. I know that's one of the things. Like when they see male babies with breasts, then they'll right. do the whole. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's very important to know that a lot of times those things don't happen um, to children. So children are um, diagnosed, I like using that word, diagnosed the wrong sex assigned at birth. Um, Thank you so much. Um, Sure, let me get you a mic. Look at you, And this is another question. I was watching something and I saw about the stone walls and I saw this, this, um, it, it was like a, a long pole with many signs on it about the different LGBTQ plus. And I saw something that said two spirits. Mm. Oh, nice. Yes, definitely. would love to start talking. About I would like to know more so, about that, please. Um, <laughs> Two-spirited is mostly used in the indigenous world. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is another way to explain transgenderism. Um, so for transgender and gender non-conforming folks who are indigenous, they use the term two-spirited. Um, so it's more of a spiritual thing um, than... Uh, you know, a social construct thing. It's more like if this happens to you, you are so lucky. You're born with two spirits Mm -hmm. and you have been blessed with the ability to understand the world in a way that other people aren't. So, yeah. I would like to add also, so this is yet another topic that we talk about in our (laughs) professional development trainings. And my created myself the trans diagram. I'm so proud. So, I, uh, two-spirit is also looked at as when they identify individuals of indigenous uh, nations of two-spirited, they're revered and looked at as people yeah. who have a, uh, a better and more closer connection to their higher power and divination. Um, so I also like to make clear when we do certain uh, presentations and we and you'll see like that elongated acronym that involves a uh, you know, third gender, two-spirit. I want people to understand moving forward that if you get the permission of these nations, because that's how I address them as nations, because they are almighty, um, when you get the permission from them to do that, that's one thing. But do not erase the cultural, especially Mm -hmm. ancient cultural ties to those terms, because that is something that is going to be with them even beyond Mm -hmm. um, these particular westernized definitions of what gender expansion and sexuality expansion is. So I always tell people, yes, you can recognize third gender and two-spirited individuals as a part of this community, but never forget their cultural, you know, attachments to them. Because I'm real big on respecting both culture and how that sometimes translates into other aspects of growing communities and diverse uh, communities. Uh, So just wanted to put that out there. But yeah, so in a way, yes, they are part of the larger acronym of queerness and transness, but also there is this cultural variation that is very, very important and that these nations hold dear to them. You're welcome. Um, mm-hmm. And to add on to that as well, Go it is ahead. important to know that in other countries, they are also third gender. Um, mm-hmm. They're also third genders, so yeah, um, like they won't use Asian. like yeah, they won't use like um, transgender. They use like I believe it's Hydra, Hydras, Hydras, and then in, that's India. Yes. And then in Mexico, they have Mushes, mm-hmm. um, which are another third spirit, um, third gender. Mm-hmm. So understanding that um, in other Um, non-Western or non-American, United States, not American, (laughs) non-United States um, countries that a lot of times third genders are um, very much accepted. Um, On the contrary to what most people believe that um, in these other countries that automatically like, you're in danger if you go to this country, um, which you you're in danger everywhere you go, but a lot of times it's really like revered and very much um, spiritual. And I really think a lot of colonialism has ruined what people saw as a true spirit, Mm -hmm. spirited connection. 
which speaks to why, you know, we just don't get it. This is nothing that is new. Nope. And mm -hmm. uh, our indigenous ancestors, and, and even right now, they, they get it. Mm -hmm. And they, they saw this first. Mm. We, we always want to label and name it to make us comfortable. Yeah. And that's the danger. So to have that type of reverence with original people, you know, it doesn't take two and two to get four. It's, it's very, very simple. We just, we make it very, very complex. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much for that. Um, we have reached the end of our time for tonight. <laughs> Um, I want to say thank you to all of the library staff who had a role tonight um, and to our amazing panelists who are here with us. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this has been a great conversation and I know it's going to continue, so thank you all very much. Yay. Definitely. Thank you. Yes. Can I get those slides? Yes. So, I'll be right back to get you those slides.